Roasts. Who do these kids think they are? Diss tracks. Everyone is like, this is the best diss track ever. Flexing. Nice 20s, I need blue on my bills. Controversies. So guys, if you want to rip her, she won't sue you. All things Rice Gum was famous for. YouTube in 2016 to 2017 was a very different platform from the YouTube we know today. Drama was at its peak, people were making diss tracks on each other, and one of the people at the forefront of all this was Rice Gum. If you grew up in the mid-2010s, you most likely have, at the very least, heard of him. But now that it's been more than six years since the peak of his popularity, what can we say about his time on YouTube? How does his career hold up? Today, we're gonna look back at the controversial world of Rice Gum. This is the Rice Gum Retrospective. Brian Lee, who we would come to know as Rice Gum, was born on November 19th, 1996 in Las Vegas. Not much is known about his life growing up, but we do know that he started his channel in 2012, when he was 15. His first publicly available video is both a Call of Duty and Storytime video. Yo, what up? It's your boy Rice. Rice Flavored Gum. You call me Brian, that's my real name, you know? Because all you guys are, you know, my subscribers. If you're here for tips and a good gameplay, I can't provide that, but if you're here just to have fun, I'm really funny, I think. The next video still up on his channel is Day in a Life with Rice Gum, a pretty normal and down-to-earth vlog from Rice, who was still just a regular high school student at the time. When you look at the top comments, you'll see people lamenting how he changed and became less humble over the years. He uploaded more videos after this and would eventually reach a major milestone, 50,000 subscribers. Guys, thank you. I don't want to sound fake and overreact and stuff like that, you know. Um, every video, I always thank you guys. I just want you guys to know that I am thankful for you guys and stuff like that. Now, it was around this time that he would upload his true claim to fame, a video titled, These Kids Must Be Stopped. In this video, Ricegum reacts to a bunch of Musical.ly kids lip-syncing to inappropriate songs, and makes a skit poking fun at them. Now first, I feel like I need to give some background since it's been kind of a long time. So, before TikTok was even a thing, there was Musical.ly. Musical.ly was a platform that started in April 2014 in which people made short videos of themselves lip-syncing to songs. ByteDance would eventually acquire Musical.ly near the end of 2017, and in August 2018, they would merge it into TikTok. And back then, there were kids who actually got famous from making videos on Musical.ly. And when you think about it, these kids are a big part of the reason Ricegum blew up the way he did. There's also the fact that this was around the time that cringe culture was about to reach its absolute peak on YouTube, and Rice's content roasting people fit into that. But I do want to clarify that he didn't just roast kids, and he had videos where he didn't roast anybody at all. The content that he blew up with had this appeal to it that made you feel like he was just a regular guy trying to make entertaining videos. And you know what? I'm gonna say it. Sometimes he was funny. Now hold on, some of you are probably appalled that I would say that, but he had his funny moments. I'm not president of the Rice Gum fan club, but I'm also not gonna act like this man never said anything funny. But don't get me wrong, I don't think it was right that he was roasting these children. Like in the context of his These Kids Must Be Stopped series, it at least made more sense since the whole point of the series was to highlight the fact that kids are doing inappropriate things on social media and poke fun at that. But then you have five whole videos of him reacting to little girls roasting him. She just said I look like a baked potato. Does she own a mirror? I swear, dude, these girls want me to roast them. Cause like, what's up with the side ponytail? You know that episode when Spongebob lost his eyebrows? Where are your eyebrows? This girl looks like Honey Boo Boo, no eyebrows. Why are they roast me like another girl that doesn't have eyebrows, man? They just want me to roast them. Where are her eyebrows? Not all of it was based on picking on people's appearances, but there's still a fundamental imbalance here considering that these were just a bunch of kids. I think one reason many of his viewers didn't question it was that a lot of Ricegum's audience was around the age of the people he was roasting. And it was a different time. Keep in mind, this was when Leafy was getting popular, who also made fun of children. There's also the fact that people can be quite ruthless to those who are perceived as cringeworthy. There's a video he made called Mackenzie Ziegler Roast Me, diss track. Basically, Mackenzie was a 12-year-old girl at the time who was known for her videos on Musical.ly and for being in a show called Dance Moms. And she didn't like Rice Gum. He gets famous <laughs> off of like people my age. By literally them <clears throat> roasting him, he gets famous by that. 
She also encouraged her viewers to comment a bunch of L's on Risegum's Instagram. Oh, the humanity. And so he makes this diss track in which he repeatedly roasts her teeth. You stuck in the shadow of your own sister. She has more followers, but your teeth are bigger. Teeth same color as a lemon. Think you're doing big things because you're on TV. Only thing big about you is your damn teeth. I really didn't want to do this, man. Nah, I think you wanted to do it. It's, it's just a funny note. It's just a funny video. Let's move on. While it's true that he doesn't seem to actually hate her or anything, at the end of the day, he still made fun of a 12-year-old's appearance in front of millions of people. One kid who was popular to make fun of at the time was Jacob Sartorius, who rose to prominence through his videos on Vine and Musical.ly. Rice made a total of nine videos with Jacob's name in the title, and the very first diss track he uploaded was actually about Jacob. However, it was nothing too serious, and they would even go on to collaborate multiple times. In the summer of 2016, Ricegum decided to work together with FouseyTube, who was also very popular on YouTube at the time, to manufacture drama. They staged a fake video in which Rice pretends to fight Fousey. Fousey would make a video called, Why Ricegum Punched Me, Exposed, in which he gives us a behind-the-scenes look of them filming the video. He would try to make a point about how it's bad that there's such a market for YouTube drama. There's a problem on YouTube. The YouTube audience is gravitated towards drama. Though it's up to you to decide whether or not that was really why he decided to stir up fake drama. Also, Fousey. What are you doing? What the hell is this fool doing? But although Ricegum had his fake beef with FouseyTube, in my opinion, the first substantial controversy Rice got himself into was when Onision brought to light an old clip of Rice making insensitive remarks to a r victim. I told this dude no, I don't want it, and then, like, I was, like, drunk, and then... Yeah, and so that's why I don't really count that, but... What, he r***ed you? Yeah, I mean... But did you I sue still... him and shit or no? No, I didn't. You got r***ed? Yeah, bro. And this, and this dude, he r***ed like hella people. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> no, no, but did it feel good though? No, I didn't. Damn, it was like how long like, was it? How long? No, like in time of the... Like how long like did the r*** last for? <clears throat> like what like five minutes or less oh okay so it's not that bad damn so guys if you want to rape her she won't sue you so shut up wanna... yeah wait where do you live hey where do you live me yeah in oregon portland oregon well i'm about to be there soon <laughs> yeah we should definitely hang out it should go without saying that these were horrible things to say so he posted an apology video about the situation so everyone started freaking out because it was so random and I started freaking out. I didn't know what to say because once again, it is live. So I, everything I said is like saved there, right? I can't like think about what to say. It's literally like a regular conversation live. So I'm like, uh, I'm a crack a joke. And it was the worst time to crack a joke. And I probably shouldn't have said what I said. I regret it. And I will regret it for like the next 10 years. I'll be like, why did I say that? And I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. It's worth mentioning that he posted it on his second channel, not his main channel, and this drew criticism, as people felt that he was trying to avoid accountability by posting it on a smaller platform in hope of it not getting as much attention. Now, if he was going to make an apology video, then he should have just left it at him apologizing for what he did. However, he decides to start going at Onision. Onision's over here, you know, preaching it, and I totally agree with him, but, like, he's such a hypocrite, because on his Twitter, he's always making jokes about Like, I'm not sure if he knows where I can search up his old tweets, but this dude's a hypocrite. But I'm not here to, like, point fingers at people. I'm sorry, just kind of ironic how he's the one exposing me when he jokes about all the time. Now, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you'd know that I'm not exactly a fan of Onision. But in an apology video like this, it would have been better if Rice just kept it to his apology, instead of bringing Onision into it. Furthermore, he decided to put five ads on the video. I guess we should be glad this didn't happen five years later, or else we'd be getting a Raid Shadow Legends ad mid-apology. There's also the fact that when he was showing what he said to the woman, he left out this part... Oh, uh, okay, so it's not that bad. ...and this part. So guys, if you want to rape her, she won't sue you, so... But even though he monetized the video, he at least apologized to the woman he said it to. So I was like streaming and then I called you or whatever. And then you told me like that story about how like you got raped or whatever. Oh yeah, yeah, I remember. Yeah, so it's like, um, 
I think like after you told me the story, like I started laughing or you know I said something pre like pretty rude or whatever, and then um, I just wanted to call you and say sorry. You know I didn't mean to say that, and I probably shouldn't have said what I said. It should have been more mature about it. Yeah, I mean I I don't really remember you saying anything like that. Like that I remember that was like you know bad really. I said something like. I didn't feel good or something and just, I don't know, it was, it was uh, really stupid. Uh, well, it's okay. I mean, I, I'm not even really tripping. I knew you were joking around, like, the entire time. Like, you wasn't really, like, like, that's just in your nature, you know? Haters are going to be like, Racecom, you didn't even mean the apology to her and you sounded so fake and why were you smiling through the whole thing? Imagine calling someone and asking them about something from a year ago that you're, like, not proud of. Like, calling her and be like, Hey, you remember that one time I roasted you about being, you know, it's, it, it, like, it was kind of awkward. It was really early too, so. But one last time, I am sorry to anyone that was affected by this or anyone that was offended or felt disrespected. This joke wasn't funny at all. Rape is not a joke. Rape should be taken seriously and I don't know why I thought this was a good idea. He was old enough that he should have known better, but it's been almost a decade at this point and I think he learned from this incident by now. But this was one of his most infamous controversies. Ricegum would also be criticized for complaining about not being in YouTube Rewind and listing specific YouTubers who were in it that he felt were irrelevant. Like these names right here, I'm sorry if I'm calling you out. I'm pretty sure you're a super chill person, but these people right here were popping in 2015, 2014. Like they were like doing numbers back then. But in 2016, like who, like there were so many people in the video that I was like, who the f like, who are these people? If you're watching this right now, YouTube, you can have all those people in the rewind. That's fine with me. Have all those guys that are irrelevant now. Just at least show respect to the people that was grinding, you know, hard and shit. A year later, in his video about the 2017 rewind, he actually acknowledged that he handled it wrong. Obviously, I wasn't happy, and I really do feel like I handled the situation wrong. I basically made a full video just crying and basically calling everyone in the video irrelevant, and they, like that's the wrong way to handle it. Yet, despite acknowledging that he handled it wrong before, in this exact video, he still calls other people irrelevant. You guys couldn't just Photoshop me there so I fit in, kind of, you know what I'm saying? And just take a look around, and I've been holding back off video, I've been holding back, but I can't take it anymore. Look around! Who are these guys? These guys are irrelevant! Stop. Now, you could argue that this was a joke, and I do think he was half-joking, but he seemed to be genuinely frustrated. Though this controversy would pale in comparison to what would come next. One of the most publicized controversies Ricegum ever found himself in was with Gabby Hanna. Well, it all started when Rice roasted her and made a diss track on her back in 2016. If you're wondering why Rice made a video dissing Gabby, basically, it's because he saw a tweet that she made which she later clarified was meant to be about reaction channels, but Rice took it to be about him in particular, when it wasn't. This was the tweet in question. If your entire channel is built on the name of other popular users for clickbait and research engine results, I don't respect your channel. And you know, at this point, I'm like, who could she possibly be talking about? I mean, it doesn't ring a bell. I don't know who she's talking about. In his diss track, he made fun of Gabby's appearance and accused her of stealing jokes. Gabby responded with a spoken word parody diss track, pointing out that while she stole one joke, Rice has stolen multiple jokes. After this, things calmed down. But around ten and a half months later, they found themselves at a party together. Gabby would end up challenging Ricegum to a rap battle while filming the encounter on Snapchat. But things would immediately take a turn for the worse. Okay, so update. Sorry if it looks like I'm crying. Um, Rice Gump didn't think that joke was very funny, and he hit me in the middle of a party and shattered my phone. I can show you that in a sec. He literally, like, everyone was like, did he hit you? And I was like, yeah, he did. And my phone is broken, the screen is broken, the back camera is broken, so I need to get a new phone. She claimed that he grabbed her, held her down, hit her, and twisted her arm. She also showed what were allegedly marks on her body left by rice gum. I have like those scratches like up here and on my wrist and arm and like I had a big scratch on my leg. In a message to Philip DeFranco, she stated, quote, He was aggressive and violent. 
He forcefully pushed and grabbed at me to get it, and then slammed it down as hard as he could and stormed out. Ricegum sent her $2,200 to make up for the damage he did to her phone. But Gabby would give him back $1,100 since Rice's friend claimed on his behalf that the extra money was sent by accident. However, things wouldn't end there. The next day, Rice would go on the offensive in a series of tweets, and Gabby would post a video she filmed the previous night, after she got home from the party, further explaining her side of the story. Rice would also go on Drama Alert and Scares to discuss the situation. In his interview on Drama Alert, Rice denied that he hit Gabby and claimed that Gabby made it seem like he, quote, beat her ass. She's making it seem like I I broke her phone and I beat her ass because of what she said, right? Right. But not everything was on camera. I grab her phone, smash her phone, and run away. I didn't beat her ass. He would also claim that the bruises Gabby showed were already there, and that he wasn't the one who gave her those bruises. However, he did admit he was in the wrong, and he said that he probably shouldn't have thrown her phone. I'm in the wrong. I probably shouldn't have thrown her phone, but I mean, if you're gonna record me at a party when I'm off guard. Soon after, Gabby uploaded a video called Every Single One of Ricegum's Lies Debunked with Evidence. In this video, Gabby would refute that she was making it out to be that Rice beat her ass. And the reality is, I said the exact opposite publicly right away on multiple platforms. I'm not saying that he like beat the shit out of me. I'm not trying to say that like Rice Gum like held me down and like punched me in the face. He didn't like beat the shit out of me if that's the impression that you guys are getting. She would also defend her use of the word hit, claiming that it was only used in the heat of the moment. I did say it in the heat of the moment. As soon as it happened, I kept saying Rice Gum hit me because yes, when a man is on top of you and grabbing at you, it feels like, yes, he hit me. But also, she would suggest that while she was not hit in the way that most people use the word, that the definition may allow her to say as such. The definition of hit is bring one's hand in contact with, quickly and forcefully, which he did, cause harm or distress to, which he did. Now, as I mentioned previously, Rice accused Gabby of lying about receiving bruises from him since in this photo before the incident, she appears to already be bruised. You can go watch in the snap, she had those bruises before anything, like I didn't give her those bruises, that's it. Gabby addressed this by showing that she previously tried to make it clear that those specific bruises were not inflicted by him. It's worth mentioning that she also clarified in a tweet that what she was trying to show was actually a scratch on her leg, but that her camera was too foggy because it broke. Also, Gabby shows us that Rice claimed in the interview with Scarce that he doesn't even have nails. Bro, I don't even have nails! Insinuating that it'd be impossible for her to be scratched by him. However, Ricegum had taken this short video mocking Gabby. No, look. Watch. Oh my god, he hit me. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, he hit me! Oh my god, he hit me! Oh. Gabby not only uses this to show that Rice is able to scratch with his nails, but also claims that this video was meant to insinuate that she harmed herself and that she lied about what happened. Gabby also accuses Rice of changing his story on whether or not there was a struggle between different interviews. Basically, on Drama Alert, Rice said this, I grab her phone, smash her phone, and run away. I didn't beat her ass. But when he spoke about the incident to Scarce, it becomes clear that there was a struggle. I grab her phone, she kind of holds on tight though, because, you know, it's her phone. So I kind of had to use two hands to, like, to, no. What did you say that was assault, though? Gabby then proceeds to show a tweet by Rice, in which he admits to destroying the phone due to Gabby recording him, and apparently, one time he was at the mall with his side girl, and some kid was making fun of him and filming him. Basically just saying, these guys roasted you, hold this owl. And so he decided to go wreck it Ralph on this kid's phone. Imagine being a kid and Rice Gum smashes your phone, and you try to tell your friends at school what happened and nobody believes you, but then Rice Gum just straight up admits to it in a tweet. Gabby ended up filing a police report but decided to not go through with it. Similarly, Rice Gum said he got lawyers involved due to defamation, but nothing came of this either. Anyway, Rice soon after uploaded a video titled The Gabby Show Lied About Being Abused, My Best Diss Track. In the video, he claimed that he did not hit her and reenacted the situation to show what actually happened according to him. Rice also showed the testimony of Romeo Lacoste, who was there the night of the incident. But before I show you the clip, it's important to note that aside from the fact there are serious allegations against Romeo, there are multiple other reasons to doubt his credibility. 
but we will get to that later. For now, here's the clip. Did I see him hit her? Definitely not. Did he twist her arm? Definitely not. Um, he wasn't pinning her down. He didn't hit her, he didn't twist her arm. And you know, Gabby sits on the couch and sticks the camera in his face snapping, you know? So he tells her like, hey, can you, can you not post that? So she just kept snapping and you know, doing more snaps, talking about the diss. And you know, he, he asked her, I think maybe like two or three more times, like, hey, can you not post that? And she just kept filming and he just jumped up, you know? and went to reach for her phone, and it was more of like a tug of war, you know, them pulling the phone back and forth, maybe for a few seconds, and then he snatched the phone out of her hand and slammed down the ground and broke the phone and then walked out. Now, this was only part of Romeo's video. Let's examine a couple of other things Romeo said. First, Romeo was talking about how people don't like to be recorded at parties in general. You know, we're at a birthday party, so I feel like maybe it's not the right place and situation to be doing, you know, that kind of stuff because, you know, everyone's drinking, so it's not like everyone wants to be on camera and things like that. But according to Gabby, people were filming at the party. This is also backed up by this clip in iDub's Content Cop, which shows that people are filming, including Rice Gum himself. More about the Content Cop later. Second, Romeo states that he talked to Rice Gum after the incident and that Rice had sent Gabby $2,000 right away, even more than her phone's worth. He sent two thousand dollars like right away pretty much to pay for the phone and obviously the phone doesn't cost two thousand bucks so you know but as mentioned previously rice sent her twenty two hundred dollars by accident and then immediately wanted the extra money back as seen in this screenshot whether he intentionally left that out or not leaving out this information still further undermines the credibility of his account of events anyway back to rice gum's video Rice explained why he smashed Gabby's phone, basically saying that it wasn't because he couldn't take a joke, but rather because he was angry that she continued to film him despite him asking her not to. His diss track on Gabby became one of his most popular diss tracks ever, amassing over 50 million views. Nonetheless, the drama would soon fade away, but Gabby would open up about it years later to talk about just how negatively it affected her, and how it made her less trusting of people. She would even recall how she went to a shopping center and on multiple occasions would be harassed because of this incident. I would go to The Grove, which is like a shopping center here, and on like multiple occasions just had gaggles of teenage boys following me around asking me about rice gum and asking if my phone was broken and filming me and mocking me. A lot of people are of the mindset that what happens on the internet isn't really that serious because it's just the internet. But I think this situation really shows that something that started out as petty internet beef can escalate into something more serious. And because Gabby refused to go on big channels like Drama Alert and Scarce, less people were aware of her side of the story. There are millions of people who have heard Rice Gum's side, but not Gabby's. It was around the time of the Gabby drama that Rice moved to Los Angeles and into the Cloud House with FaZe Banks. That summer, Rice Gum released a diss track on Jake Paul called It's Every Night Sis which featured Alyssa Violet, Jake Paul's ex-girlfriend. It's Every Night Sis is his most viewed video by a huge margin, racking up almost 200 million views at the time I'm making this video. In fact, the song even went platinum in the United States and charted at number 80 on the Billboard Hot 100. And even though Rice Gum doesn't have the best reputation, people are still going back to the song and commenting about their nostalgia for this era of YouTube. A little over a month after the song's release, he would drop another diss track on Jake Paul called God Church, which was, of course, a reference to this lyric from It's Every Day Bro. It's definitely less memorable than It's Every Night Sis, but it's still Rice Gum's second most popular video, sitting at over 75 million views. Both of these videos are really a testament to just how big this drama was at the time. Man, I remember when everyone was talking about Jake Paul. You just couldn't escape him. Aside from Logan Paul, I'd say Rice Gum was absolutely one of the people who benefited the most from the conveyor belt of controversy that came from Jake Paul. Well, and Keemstar too. But Rice Gum was about to be the subject of a nuclear video. On October 3rd, 2017, iDubs released what would become his most popular content cop. Although it was titled Content Cop Jake Paul, it would actually turn out to be about Ricegum, who iDubs considers to be the Asian Jake Paul. It's worth noting that a little over a year before this, Ricegum actually made a video called Message to iDubs the Content Cop, in which he says that he wants iDubs to make a content cop on him. Apparently I clicked dislike on this back in the day. Oh! 
Now, when iDubbbz dropped the content cop on Ricegum, it was a big deal. To give you an idea of just how massive this video was, the video had over 52 million views, even more than the content cop on Leafy is here. But unfortunately, the video was taken down by a copyright strike. However, there are numerous re-uploads of the video out there. I'll go over the main parts of it. In the content cop, Idub showed the clips of Ricegum making the rape comments. He also criticized Rice for being hypocritical, notably during the Gabby incident in which he didn't want to be recorded without his consent, yet he himself lied to women by telling them they weren't on a stream when they actually were. Idubs would also point out Rice's hypocrisy when Rice denounced the influencer Christian Burns for calling a VidCon security guard irrelevant, when obviously Rice himself is known to call people irrelevant. Idubs also criticized Ricegum for not admitting to flexing on his fans. He showed a clip of Rice saying that he was flexing on his haters, not his fans, and then proceeded to explain why this doesn't make sense. Well, there comes a point where you have to realize that your fans watch your videos more than your haters watch your videos, so you are flexing on your fans. Also, Idubs advises Rice to own the fact that he flexes on his fans. You absolutely are showing off. Just fucking own it. If you're showing off, you're showing off. He also criticizes a skit Rice made about his normal life for not making sense since the skit clearly shows his multi-million dollar mansion. I don't have much of a problem with it being an inaccurate portrayal of a normal person's life, but it's just fucking lazy. Heaven forbid you film this outside or at a friend's house or anywhere that isn't a multi-million dollar mansion so that the skit actually makes sense. Now, to be fair to Ricegum, I think that is the joke that he's saying he has a normal life while also showing off his mansion right after. Idubs would also point out that Rice never announced a winner for his clickbait challenge. And last but not least, make sure to put hashtag clickbait challenge in the description because at the end of two weeks, the video with the most views will win a humongous prize. So go out, get creative, and let's get clickbaiting. Basically, the person whose video got the most views within those two weeks using the hashtag clickbait challenge was supposed to receive $10,000. But Rice didn't appear to ever pay anybody. More on this later. Idubs also criticized how Rice handled the Gabby situation. If you are ever so terrified of being put in an improvisational situation that you smash someone's phone for fear of looking like a bitch, you sort of automatically just look like a bitch. Idubs also had this to say in response to Ricegum saying that people know to not take out phones at YouTuber parties. I just want to mention as a side note that when he was on Drama Alert, he had said that when you go to these YouTuber parties, it's understood that you don't bring out your phone and you don't film people really without their permission. These YouTuber parties, people know to right. not take out phones. Or so you ask permission. People do film at those parties, and you filmed at those parties. Filming's fine when people are okay with it. You weren't okay with it because you got bamboozled. I think there are two main things from the content cop that stuck with people. First, it further ingrained the infamous did it feel good though remark into the public consciousness. If it was already relatively well known in the past, the content cop supercharged that, and even turned it into a punchline for iDub's own diss track on Ricegum. But I got one question to ask you bro, did it feel good though? Second, it really brought to light just how obnoxious Ricegum's flexing was. Even if people already didn't like it, seeing it all laid out in one video really emphasized his character flaws. I think one thing that many people still remember to this day is the clip of Rice making it rain cash on a homeless person. Ricegum responded with multiple videos related to the content cop, but for the sake of brevity, I'll only talk about his main response. Ricegum's main video about the content cop was not well received, and as of right now, it's sitting at a little over 500,000 likes and more than 1 million dislikes. In response to Idubs bringing out the r comments, Rice said he was sorry and showed the clip of him apologizing to the woman that he made the insensitive remarks to. But then he does the skit in which she comes over to his house and he pretends to cry about what he said and, well... Not so bad. I know you didn't mean it. I'm sorry. I know you didn't mean it. It's okay. I'm gonna go back. Could I kiss you back? I, why'd you... Did it feel good? <laughs> this is just uncomfortable. And what's with all the noise in the background? Like, what's this? Sounds like someone playing the worst kazoo ever. Rice also called out Idubs, saying that he shouldn't be the one calling him out on the r comments since Idubs made r jokes and said the n-word. 
And then Rice shows an image that compiles examples of iDubs doing this. But the thing is, Rice made those comments to an actual rape victim. It's just not the same. Furthermore, Rice shows the reactions that his black friends have to iDubs saying the n-word. They are not fans. He acknowledged that he says the word irrelevant a lot and says this. Damn, I guess I do say that word a lot. I mean, I guess I'll learn some new words. But not even a month after this video, he made another video called PewDiePie's Irrelevant Friend Roasted Me, which was about Markiplier, of all people. Markiplier. And in his video about the 2017 YouTube Rewind that I talked about earlier, he also said it there. Basically just bring in these dead, irrelevant YouTubers. In response to iDub's point about Rice's hypocrisy about filming without consent, Rice made the argument that someone filming him despite his request to not be filmed is completely different from him streaming and lying to a woman on his stream who asks him if she is live. Bro, there's a difference, all right? Like, coming up to someone and filming them and then, you know, me being like, yo, could you not? And they keep going. It's completely different from me two years ago, you know, live streaming and someone asked me, am I live? And I'm just like, no. Just so they're just more natural because as soon as they know they're live, they're gonna start acting weird and all awkward. And I just thought it'd be funny if they're just more natural. But there's still both instances of being recorded without consent. However, it's important to note that Rice has apologized for this incident. But interestingly, right after apologizing, Rice criticized iDubs for supposedly being hypocritical. This is because iDubs had recorded Rice at VidCon without his consent. But to me at least, that's not really the same thing, since VidCon is an event dedicated to YouTubers and fans interacting. A YouTuber at VidCon should expect to be photographed and recorded. Rice, on the other hand, lied to a woman on his stream about recording her. Rice also addressed the controversy with the clickbait challenge. The video in the lead, the video with the most views at the time was something about the Ariana Grande thing and it just felt wrong. And seeing people do that really turned me off. I mean, I wasn't even excited about the challenge anymore and I kind of just forgot about it and I really didn't get any tweets. You know, after two weeks, no one really brought it up and I just went on with my life. But since I know this is like my biggest fan ever, I mean, he remembers everything. I guess I owe someone 10K. Now, to be clear, I think it's reasonable to not want to reward something like this. And I can understand how Rice could have missed the fact that something like this could happen. However, he should have been more transparent about his thought process, and he could have given the reward to the second place winner instead. But Rice didn't appear interested in giving the reward to anyone. Later in the video, Rice has this to say about why he's keeping the $10,000. But a lot of people are saying my career is over, I'm falling off, you know, after the kind of cop, things won't be the same because I'm just going down and I'm getting kind of worried, like what if that's true and that 10 k might come in handy 20 years down the line? Rice is probably joking here, but him brushing off the criticism with a simple joke suggests he doesn't care about rectifying the situation. iDubs responded to Rice in a content deputy video. In regards to bringing up the r comment, he clarifies that he wasn't criticizing Rice as much as just pointing out the fact that he can be criticized. Well, you have some pretty horrible comprehension because I was hardly calling you out for it. I used it as a point to illustrate that you can be criticized for it. I didn't say that I'm morally superior to you because it seems like he has this disregard for what he can be criticized for. What would he say? And I just want to spell it out. Hey, dumbass, you did something stupid in the past. You can be criticized for it. Idubs also points out how Rice completely missed the point regarding the criticism of his use of the word irrelevant. I guess I'll learn some new words. No, the reason I showed you all those clips of you saying irrelevant was to show how much of a hypocrite you were being. He also touched on the clickbait challenge situation, wherein he claims that Colossal is Crazy was the true winner of the challenge. But more importantly, he states that the $10,000 no longer belongs to Rice and should be given to charity. However, Rice does not appear to have ever addressed this controversy again. Something I do want to point out, however, is that although content cops have gained a reputation of being able to destroy someone's career, this doesn't actually seem to be the case. Although Ricegum did suffer short-term subscriber loss, he would actually get back to gaining subscribers pretty fast, and would continue to pull in millions of views per video. With that being said, of course the content cop impacted his reputation by exposing his behavior to millions upon millions of people. Even though iDubs recently apologized to everyone he made a content cop on, that doesn't negate the fact that he still made good points, as we've seen already. Ricegum would eventually leave the Cloud House. In a now deleted video called Why I Left the Cloud House, rather than explaining the question posed in the title, he would vlog his vacation to Hong Kong. The video shows him and fellow YouTuber M to the K messing around in Hong Kong in a pretty disrespectful way. 
you understand the words that are coming out of my mouth? Is that dog or something? What, like, that shit look disgusting. Low-key, bro, we should try a little metal mouth. M to the K touches a bunch of strangers' hands, and the pair pressure an old man to eat half-eaten ice cream. I'm eating this ice cream, but like, I don't want it anymore. It's like, I'm full, so like, I don't want to waste it. So like, I'm gonna just try to give it to someone out here that might need it, you know? Like, I'm always about that positivity. Hey, can you eat this for my friend? Please, please, please. Thank eat it, eat it. I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He probably wasn't trying to be hurtful with this, but obviously that doesn't change the fact that offering a random stranger half-eaten food is just not very nice. I know. Cutting edge commentary from Christopher Tom. Ricegum then asks people if they know who he is. Hey, you know who Ricegum is? Hey, you know who Ricegum is? Do you guys know who Ricegum is? Hey, you f with Ricegum? Hey, you f with Ricegum? Sorry, you f with Ricegum? Now, I gotta be honest. This one is actually shocking to me. I can't believe they don't recognize one of the greatest rappers of our time. Maybe one day they will learn. M to the K messes with a bunch of mannequins, and Ricegum asks a whole bunch of people where he can find dog. Uh, where can I find uh, the mail mail? The, the doggy? No? Sir, uh, where can I find some dog? Hey, uh, ma'am, uh, where can I find the doggy? Yo, where are the dogs? Where are they? Yo, hey, you guys know where the dogs are at? They go into a store that's closing, and when the person in the store tells them it's closed, they say this. Closed. Oh, closed? Yo, closed, closed. They don't sell clothes, only shoes. <laughs> Come on, man. And he asks a woman offering massage services if they have happy endings. Hey, you guys have uh, happy endings? Also, throughout the video, he would also ask people about hoes. Where are the hoes at? Hey, where are the hoes at? Bitches. Where are the bitches at? Where are the bitches at? And thoughts. Where are the thoughts at? Oh, you guys have uh, thoughts here? The whole trilogy. The video was heavily criticized online, especially by social media users in China. Not long after its upload, the video was removed for violating YouTube's terms of service. It's easy to see why people were upset. Although there were definitely people who blew things out of proportion. Like this guy saying that touching strangers' hands on an escalator is assault. Oh, more public assault. Whoa, that's great. And, uh... Yeah. <laughs> that's funny, isn't it? That's funny, isn't it? Doing sexual harassment on the streets of Hong Kong. Sexual harassment. No. Just no. But regardless, obviously Ricegum and M to the K were being rude and disrespectful during their time in Hong Kong. In a video he made discussing the controversy, Ricegum characterized his behavior in the video as Just having a little bit of fun, joking around. And he talks about how somebody posted his video onto Chinese social media with subtitles. Although Rice couldn't translate the subtitles, there was a text description, which translated to Looking for prostitutes on a Hong Kong street. This Asian American red video insults China's anger. So Rice defended himself by clarifying that he was just using slang and wasn't actually looking for prostitutes. I was joking because it's like such a random question to ask like an elderly person, you know what I'm saying? And then two, in America, it's like slang, like in the hip hop and rap music, thoughts and hoes and bitches. It's like girls, not actual prostitutes. Ricegum also had this to say to the Chinese people who were critical of him. Yo, I'm Chinese also, right? And like the American culture, like I watch other like, you know, black comedians make jokes about like, you know, black stereotypes and stuff like they eat fried chicken and like white people make white jokes and you know, Hispanic people make Hispanic jokes. You know, I thought, you know, since I was Asian, you know, I was allowed to make these, you know, Asian stereotype jokes. And Keemstar said something similar to this, tweeting, Ricegum is Asian. I'm 99% sure he's allowed to joke about Asian stereotypes. Now, I'm Asian American, and I generally agree with this, but Rice directly involved people, in this case strangers, in a way that was making fun of them, which is different from, say, an Asian comedian making jokes in a stand-up routine that aren't directed towards random bystanders. Now, to be fair, there were parts that were about stereotypes but didn't directly involve random bystanders such as using the Japanese flag to symbolize Hong Kong, and him filming a dish and asking if it was dog. But for the most part, the humor was at the expense of these strangers. In his video responding to the controversy, Ricegum apologized to all of the Chinese people. Whoever stole my content and translated this wrong to make all these Chinese people hate me, translate this right now, right? Are you ready? All right, listen, man. Yo, I'm sorry to all the Chinese. Yo, quit playing around, yo. These guys think I'm racist. I gotta stop playing with them. Like, these guys don't like jokes. All right, take this seriously. Like, yo, so translate, guy. Translate this right now. Yeah. I'm sorry to all the Chinese people. It will never happen again. Sorry for being disrespectful. I wasn't looking for prostitutes. And I want to come back soon. But, like, you know, I'm kind of scared now because, like, the people out here might, you know, hit me and, like, beat me up and stuff. So, like, just 
just tell them I'm sorry so I can come back, like, you know what I'm saying? I do think this particular controversy is more so a case of immaturity rather than deliberate malice. However, I will say that the last part of the video definitely does not help him. So, you remember how he and M to the K pressured an elderly man to eat his half-eaten ice cream, right? Here, Ricegum stated that he thought he was being nice. Look at this clip, man, you know, I thought it was being nice. Good, eat it, eat it, I'm, I'm, I'm. Yeah, yeah! You know, I'm offering this guy ice cream, unfinished food that I didn't want to throw away. And then he calls out this YouTuber who criticized him for what he did. But I swear, some people just are so sensitive, like literally, cheer up a little. I don't find that funny, I just find it disrespectful. Now you don't know what this old guy is... That's, that's so rude. That, he said no, and you said no, eat it, eat it, eat it. That's bullying an old man, dude. Wow, 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 cry me a river, bro. Who's bullying who? Not me. Are you really gonna be mad about this? No one's bullying anyone. If anything, we should be bullying you, you know what I'm saying? Rice gum, you're really not helping your case here. At around the start of 2019, Ricegum and multiple other YouTubers were exposed for promoting a gambling scam to their audiences. Basically, Rice promoted a site called Mystery Brand and portrayed it as a legitimate way of making money. No losing in this, because even if you get an item that you don't like, you just sell it back. Here we go. Hey guys, so I sold it back for like a thousand, which is so weird because I bought a hundred dollar box, but I got a thousand dollar shoe out of it. So I got some profit. Yo, I can sell it back for two thousand and buy even more boxes, bro. I bought one sixty. I can sell this back for six hundred and make profit. I'm gonna do it. I'm making profit. The site offered multiple different mystery boxes. For instance, this one was just $4.99, where you could supposedly win a Bentley, a Lamborghini, a Mercedes, or other really expensive items. Or you could try this $12.99 box and win the most expensive Los Angeles realty, $250 million. You could even win the mysterious icicle sight balance. Delicious. Now, to most people, this would raise obvious alarm bells. But the problem is, Ricegum's audience was pretty young and impressionable, so they would be less likely to pick up on the red flags. Promoting a service this sketchy is bad enough, but promoting it to a particularly young fan base is even worse. Rice wasn't the only one who did this, as he would soon let everyone know, but nonetheless, he and Jake Paul would receive the most backlash for it. It's also worth noting that Ricegum had received somewhere between $200,000 and $250,000 for this promotion. How much money do they pay you? I mean, I don't want to say it, but they offer Keemstar 100k. I know. I feel like I have a guess. Yeah. It's somewhere between 200 and 250 thousand yeah, dollars. I mean, maybe, but like, <laughs> listen, he's bro. slick. He's slick. All I'm trying to say is, it was a mistake. Probably should have done it, and it'll never happen again. But shit, I made the bag. The scandal would become pretty well known, with the most popular people who covered it being PewDiePie and Ethan Klein of H3H3 Productions. Now, although it's pretty clear that the site is sketchy, the YouTubers promoting the site seemed to get pretty good results. PewDiePie's theory was that the owners of the site gave better odds to the YouTubers who promoted it, and I personally think that's a pretty plausible theory. If the site's promotion is going to come from YouTubers making videos of themselves using the site, then it makes sense that they would want to try to make it seem like you have more of a chance at winning valuable items than you actually do. Ricegum would upload a video titled, This Dude Calls Me Out For Mystery Unboxing. In the video, he acknowledges that H3H3 and PewDiePie covered the situation, and he also expresses frustration over the fact that other YouTubers promoted the same exact site but didn't get backlash like he did. He would also explain his experience using the site. My experience on it, you know, I would spend $100, and at times I got like a fidget spinner, and then I would spend $100, and at times I got like a good item. It was basically you win some, you lose some, and that's like the definition of gambling. He did say that he felt bad, and he stated that he was, quote, somewhat in the wrong. You know, I do feel bad, you know, I'm like kind of defending myself and stuff, but I do know I'm somewhat in the wrong. I'm like, I can't really do much because I already did it. The damage has been done. You guys already saw a money hungry side of me, and it is what it is. And there's nothing I can really do but say sorry and give you these Amazon gift cards. So I'm sorry. It just wouldn't happen again. Amazon codes, 10 to $20. Rice would continue to show more Amazon gift codes, but a YouTuber known as Good Day Sir would take it upon himself to investigate further. He showed himself calling Amazon customer support and was able to verify that the gift codes Rice showed were already redeemed months before, specifically on May 23rd, 2018. This date seems to line up because according to the YouTuber Duty Rhino, on that exact day, Rice was doing a Twitch stream to prove that he wasn't faking his Fortnite gameplay and he did a giveaway for every time he lost. 
Claimed on May 23rd. Now, what happened on May 23rd? Well, Ricegum did a Twitch stream where he was trying to prove to everyone at the time that he wasn't faking his Fortnite gameplay. Every time he died, he gave away Amazon gift card vouchers. And obviously, this was on the 23rd of May. All right, yo, do the giveaway, t -Wop. Come on, hurry. $10 giveaway. Every loss is $10. Furthermore, Rice was called out for snitching by Ethan Klein of H3H3. So Rice fired back with a video titled, This YouTuber is lying to you, H3H3, in which he defends himself by saying he wasn't trying to throw those other YouTubers under the bus, but rather, he was just making a point that they did it before him, but when he did it, he received significant backlash. Now, it's towards the end of the video where Rice makes his biggest misstep in responding to the controversy. This is like towards the end of the video, so a lot of people might not even see this. Yeah, that didn't really work out too well. So I'm just gonna say how it is. I think this fool is depressed or whatever because his girl be just so whack. Like, I'm sorry, someone has to say it, but like, every time his girl is in a video, bro, it's just crickets. The soldiers go just walk into the house and look through their shit and find guns. Monotone Monica over here. <laughs> nah, I'm just kidding. I don't know her name, but like, for real, she's just so boring. Although I'm not a fan of H3H3 anymore, these were tacky and tasteless low blows. There was no need to make fun of Ethan's depression or to bring Ela into it. She wasn't even in the video where Ethan was calling him out. Ultimately, Ricegum's video was met with tons of backlash, and his video ended up getting around 109,000 likes and around 221,000 dislikes. Shortly after he uploaded that video, Rice would begin to upload vlogs with his girlfriend at the time, Abby Rao, and would even start a new channel called Family Gum, which currently has over 750,000 subscribers. However, despite what the name may lead you to believe, this isn't actually a family vlogging channel. They're just normal vlogs that he would film with Abby. When they eventually broke up, he would start uploading vlogs with his new girlfriend, Ellery Marie. Rice would upload his last YouTube video on his main channel for almost three years on July 12th, 2020. And he would upload his last video on Family Gum on September 14th, 2020. But even though he stopped posting on YouTube, around nine months later, he would be exposed in one of his worst scandals yet. In June 2021, he, along with Summer Rae and multiple members of FaZe Clan, would be exposed for promoting a crypto pump and dump scam token called Save the Kids, with CoffeeZilla breaking the story. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, a BEP20 token redistributing wealth to both holders and charities. Actually, it turns out to have just redistributed wealth to the people who got in on the ground floor, AKA these guys. This scam was unique in that it was advertised that it would donate a portion of its proceeds to charity. In fact, the logo was specifically designed to look like the logo of an actual charity called Save the Children. All these people promoted this charity coin right before launch, the price pumped, they got out. They, they, they deleted their tweets suddenly out of nowhere. They said, hey, my manager called, I can't do this. They backed out of this project like a Homer Simpson meme and they ran away leaving their fans holding the bag. But although their followers may have believed they were supporting a good cause, when the coin officially launched, anti-dump measures meant to prevent large coin holders from dumping their stake in the coin were suspiciously dropped. Soon after, the price of the coin plummeted, with one coin holder claiming he lost 50% of his money only two minutes after launch. In the wake of this event, people began to scrutinize the influencers involved. And this, of course, included Ricegum. During a Drama Alert interview, when Keemstar brought up the fact that Ricegum had been involved in a crypto scam, Ricegum just left the call. Both of you recently have been involved in crypto scams. Any thoughts on that? Aiden? Rice? It's worth noting that Aiden Ross wasn't involved with Save the Kids in particular, but with another scam, which I don't think I can say the name of if I want to stay monetized. While it may seem that Rice was willing to keep his mouth shut about the incident, he would reveal more about his side of the story during a live stream. And let's just say it doesn't paint him in a much better light. Rather than trying to take it seriously like other creators were, or at least denying accusations of fraud, Rice took a different approach. Rice would not only refuse to take responsibility... The coin is owned by certain people, they got names on it, I'm not involved. But he would also talk on stream about how his lawyer has asked him to put the blame on others. And my lawyer told me, he was like, if they call you up, just point that person, 
point that person, I'm pointing that person, this person did that, that person did that, so I'm good, I'm good, I, I, I just did one tweet. In response to someone asking about the crypto scam, Rice had this to say. But we said, what about the crypto scam? Bro, y'all not scamming like me, bro. Y'all need to tap in. No, guys, I'm totally joking, bro. B blame, blame those other peoples, bro. I just posted it. I did one tweet, bro, and that's it. Some of y'all need to get on that scamming wave, bro. It, dude, it, no, but some of y'all need to start scamming people, bro. Y'all late. <laughs> nah, guys, I'm joking. I'm always joking. He also said a couple of times that if you're trying to scam, you should hit his line. I told you guys, bro, me me and Kay are hella close. Like, me like me and Kay are hella close, so, you know what I'm saying? Y'all talking about scamming and da-da-da, like, you know what I'm saying? Hey, y'all need to tap in type shit. Tap in, bro. Yo, if y'all trying to scam, hit my line, bro. If y'all, yo, if y'all trying to scam, hit my line. Y'all need to tap in with me. Nah, so look, yo, hit, yo, hit my line. Yo, if y'all want some crypto shit, wow, hit my uh, line, bro. It's the new Even if it was just a joke, it's still pretty tasteless that he decided to act this way. Rice would also defend himself by saying that he only made one tweet and thus felt like he didn't have much of an impact. Look, bro, I didn't even do an Insta story. I didn't even do a YouTube. I didn't, you know, I just did a tweet and then I deleted it. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, that's why I feel like I had no impact. Like, I had the tiniest impact. I just did a tweet and, did, you know, shit like that. However, this is not true, as you can clearly see him in this promo clip for Save the Kids. At this point, it had already been almost a year since his last upload. But one month after CoffeeZilla uploaded his video exposing the Save the Kids scam, that would be the last time Ricegum would stream on Twitch for almost two years. And then there's the time that he wanted to box iDubs, but then backed out of it. Now, let me give you some more context. In 2018, Rice said this on Drama Alert about wanting to box iDubs. Down, if he's down, we'll make it happen. If not, then he's a pussy. Three years later, Rice reached out to iDubs' wife, Anissa, saying, Yo, tell iDubs to fight me. He fell off. iDubs said he responded to Rice and then showed DMs of them talking about it, and Rice seemed like he was serious. So, after months of trying to make the event a reality, iDubs finally found someone who could set up the event. But Rice would repeatedly ghost the boxing promoter, as well as iDubs. Then, when he finally responded, he said things like, Oh, my neck is sore. Okay, wh what From playing Fortnite? iDubs claimed that Rice wanted more than a million dollars. He wants like a million plus dollars, and I'm like, Ricegum, you're a gangly loser that has zero boxing experience. And you're not even very famous. But even though iDubs and Ricegum obviously never ended up boxing, iDubs would eventually box Dr. Mike in the first Creator Clash, a charity boxing event run by him and his wife Anissa. And even though the second Creator Clash was a failure, the first one was quite successful. And I don't know if it would have happened if Ricegum didn't decide to pull out of boxing iDubs. Whew, that was a lot. So that brings us to the question, what happened to Ricegum? Well, people wouldn't hear much from him for almost two years, aside from the occasional tweet. But why did Ricegum leave the public eye? In one of his streams, he explained that he didn't want to create videos anymore because he was no longer receiving the same attention that he had previously. I've seen five mil in one day, I've seen nine mil, in, like I've seen four mil in one day, I've seen three mil in one day, so when YouTube, I had a theory where YouTube just stopped pushing my shit, I was never in recommended and shit. And when I start getting one or two mil a video, I'm like, yo, this is not it, bro. Like, I've been doing this for four, dude, I was doing that four years ago. It's mad repetitive, bro. It really is repetitive. Like, you do the same shit over and over. It's an endless, bro. It's endless, bro. It's like you post a video, guys, and you have to go post another one, bro. And after you're done, you have to go do another one, bro. And then another one. And then, like, it's just exhausting, bro. But on January 29th, 2023, Ricecom posted a tweet hinting at the possibility of a comeback of some kind. But before this would happen, tragedy would strike. Almost three months later, Ricegum uploaded a vlog called Baby Girl, in which he and his girlfriend Ellery Marie were looking forward to the birth of their child. But towards the end of the video, it was revealed that at 35 weeks into the pregnancy, they were told their baby no longer had a heartbeat. I can't even imagine what it would be like to go through a tragedy like this. And I offer my condolences to Ricegum, Ellery, and their families. Around a month later, Ricegum made his comeback to Twitch. 
However, Ricegum would soon make a major decision, with both Rumble and Kick vying to get him on their platform. On July 4th, 2023, he tweeted out this image showing himself looking at four different hats, which from left to right represent Twitch, Rumble, Kick, and YouTube in order to hype up the announcement he was going to make about it the following day. Many speculated that he was going to move to Kick, but they would be proven wrong when Rice announced on stream that he would stream on Rumble. So yeah, that leaves me with Rumble. Yes, sir! We got the contract right here. I don't even know if I should read it. It's thick. It's thick, yo. It's a thick contract. I'm about to sign my soul away, yo. Despite everything that has happened, Ricegum has had a pretty resilient career. Even though Rice may have faced social backlash for the controversies he was in, he was mostly unscathed in the grand scheme of things, despite the fact that he promoted a gambling scam to his young and impressionable audience, as well as a crypto pump and dump scam that masqueraded as a charity that would help dying children. And so, this begs the question, how has he been able to withstand so much controversy? I think this has a lot to do with how he got famous in the first place. He built his career off of roasting and dissing people, which isn't exactly the most positive thing. And so, when Rice did get into controversy, although he may have faced backlash from the broader community, a lot of his fans were willing to forgive his actions because he wasn't exactly a role model to begin with. Ricegum doing something bad just wouldn't be as jarring as if, say, Ryan Higa did something bad. There's also the fact that a lot of his fans were kids, who tend to not really be mature enough to grasp the severity of these things. So because expectations weren't exactly high for Rice in the first place, combined with his younger audience, this put him in a position where despite all of his controversies, he was still able to have a very successful career. Now to his credit, the Rice Gum of today is noticeably different from the Rice Gum of 2017. While the old rice gum was inflammatory and known to stir the pot, the new rice gum seems more reserved and down to earth. Though, I do wonder how much of that has to do with the fact that he is primarily a streamer now, since the high energy YouTube persona is simply unsustainable for prolonged periods of time. Now that he's older, hopefully he takes the influence he has more seriously. This has been the rice gum retrospective. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.